Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to review a, a book by Terry Wilson called Four Sides of the Circle, which Terry very kindly sent to me over Christmas. And basically it covers the, the period 1970 to 1974, and it actually describes it as the Beatles' second phase, because the actual Beatles' partnership had not been dissolved until December 74. So he's counting these first solo year projects as kind of as if the group, well, not as if they were still together, but they did participate on each other's records. And also, I've all often thought that that period is, is well, it's obviously the closest time-wise to the Beatles split, and also I think they have more in common with each other in those first five years over the split, appearing on each other's records and appearing on the Apple label, which was obviously their common label towards the end of the Beatles. So um, it's a good subject. It's obviously inspired, I think, from by Ian McDonald's Revolution in the Head, which covers the Beatles music of the 60s. And I noticed that the typeface that uh, Terry Wilson has used is quite similar, not identical, but quite similar. So he's to Ian McDonald. So he's basically got a, an essay on each song and he's got the musician credits and it's very well researched. I've got quite a lot to say about this book, so I better get on with it. Um, yeah, first of all, I'll cover the musical knowledge aspect, which is very strong. I, th I mean, Terry Wilson knows what he's talking about. He's, he knows his subject. He knows the songs. He knows the musicality of the songs in terms of the chord changes, uh, melodies, and all that kind of stuff. And he knows if a song is derivative of Dylan, you know, for example, Give Me Love, reminiscent of um, I Want You from Bob Dylan. And I forget there was one other which is reminiscent of you know it ain't it's all over now baby blue um, and also things like uh, the words of remember from John Lennon I hadn't realised this until he pointed it out to me uh, basically copied from the Sam Cooke song bringing it up, bring it all home to me from the rock and roll album you know if you ever change your mind about leaving leaving me behind. So that's obviously at a different tempo to the Remember song, but that was interesting. Uh, the book is full of things. I mean, I, I was wondering if how much I would new stuff I'd pick up, having been a fan since 1978. There's plenty of stuff for even seasoned fans to, uh, to delve into and um, be educated by, really. Uh, the lyrics are, are well well reviewed in this book as well. He doesn't always He's not sycophantic about the songs or the lyrics, and he, when he doesn't like it, something he says it. Uh, I was, didn't even realise that uh, Waiting on You All from George had a bit of a dig at John when, it, when he sings You Don't Need a Love In, You, need, you Don't Need No Bedpan. Uh, I think that probably a little bit of a dig at, um, at the, the bed-ins for peace, as uh, Terry Wilson says, and I hadn't even picked up on that. And also, I hadn't realised that EMI had had admitted the Pope owns 51% of General Motors from the lyric sleeve, but I looked it on the, on the record and sure enough, it's not there. Um, same with Cock in Your Hand from I Found Out, that's asterisked out as well, which I hadn't realised. I was familiar with Working, working Class Hero being um, censored, but not the other two. Uh, so I think Terry Wilson manages to balance being a fan and being an objective critic quite well. Um, and at the same time avoids, whilst he does try to be objective, I think he avoids being too judgmental and he tries to see what's behind each song and what each Beatle was attempting to be, if not always successfully. So he's, um, what I found with McDonald's book, he's quite um, righteous in his writing, as if he, his view is the only one that matters. And uh, Terry Wilson takes a tight, slightly different slant and more often than not says, well, this song is well remembered or this song is forgotten, which is, which is one way of looking at it. Um, but there are, there are times when uh, Terry d says that he doesn't like a song. For example, he's not a fan of Mumbo, the opening track of Wildlife, not a fan of Bit Bop, not a fan of the um, lyrics of Monkberry Moon Delight, um, not a fan of the song Little Woman Love, very much. By the way, just just before I continue, I was looking at uh, this this magazine here, which is cover, covering the first ten years of the seventies, and various journalists are reviewing the albums. And I 
did find Ian McDonald had reviewed the rock and roll album in, in, in this magazine, so that was quite interesting. And he's quite effusive about it, actually. Um, probably more so than, um, than Terry Wilson. But anyway, that was on a side note. He also reviews the single of Live and Let Die in this magazine. With basically, this magazine is taken from NME, Melody Maker, Sounds, and, and Ian McDonald used to write for those music, that music press publications in the 70s. Um, so where was I? Uh, interesting new facts I learned. Well, there are so many, but I'll take you go tell you a few. I mean, Freddie Lennon's That's My Life, the dreadful single that he came up with in 65, is singing this awful song. But as Terry Wilson points out, the chord changes from C to F at the beginning are very reminiscent of Imagine, Al although that's just a chord change at the end of the day, and the Oasis used it for Don't Look Back in Anger, it's still worthy of note and I was uh, interested to read that. I remember Jeep, the song from All Things Must Pass on the Apple Jam. I didn't realise that was written about Clapton's dog, which was lost, and then turned up again and is on the front cover of There's One in Every Crowd, which is an album I was listening to recently. <laughs> uh, there's a good, very good account of the John... Uh, there was going to be a John, George and Paul meeting at the Plaza Hotel in December 74 to meet the... Um, to sign the final dissolution papers, but John, even though he lived a few blocks away, <coughs> didn't turn up because the stars weren't right, and so it was just George and Paul, and if you look at Martin Scorsese's uh, Living in the Material World documentary, there's some good footage of that, George and Paul looking very uncomfortable as they're signing these papers. And actually, Terry Wilson tells this story of uh, th there was this lawyer trying to serve him a writ, probably connected with the Alan Klein controversy or something, and, and so George had to leg it up a staircase to escape, you know, reminiscent of Beatlemania times, escaping from the fans, or, 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 although on this occasion he's escaping from a lawyer. Um, what else is interesting from this book? Richard Hewson the, did the string arrangement on Dear Friend, and no, he's the same guy who did the string arrangement for Phil Spector on Long and Winding Road. So um, Paul had obviously forgiven Richard for that, which is interesting because at the time he was completely slagging off the arrangement um, and even in recent years he's been slagging it off but maybe he he blamed Spectre rather than blamed Houston who was just brought in to do a job and did, did quite a good one, I'm not sure. But anyway, that was interesting. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the 1971 peace meeting between John and Paul in Bank Street in New York City uh, where they kind of agreed not to slag each other off in public. That's covered in the book. Um, where Paul took John through a series of newspaper articles saying what, that he'd slagged John off and Paul explaining his side of the story and John, John chose to believe him. Anyway, that did remark, did end in a truce and they no longer did slag each other off in public. So for me, that's an important meeting. Um, I, I think probably the most controversial thing in, in this book is, is when Terry says uh, he would re-sequence the Ram album and actually, uh, he says if he had his way, he would get rid of too many people and th three legs and replace them with um, Get On The Right Thing and Little Ram Dragonfly, which were left off Ram and turned up, turned up later on Red Rose Speedboat. So that was, I thought that was interesting because too many people and three legs are, for me, not the weakest tracks on Ram at all. Um, and if you force me to do that, to leave off two tracks from Ram, it would probably be Smile Away and uh, maybe Longhead Lady, but not, not those two. So th that was interesting. Material World, um, Terry Wilson is a little bit harsh on the slow numbers, saying there's too many slow numbers, not enough guitar and too much keyboards. But then he does credit Gary, White, Gary Wright's keyboard part on the light that has light lighted the world as the best moment on the album. So, and for me, I've never, never thought that there was too much keyboards. I think, I think the keyboards are lovely, whether it's Nicky Hopkins or Gary Wright playing them, I'm not too sure. Um, uh, and I think as far as guitar playing um, is concerned, at least it wasn't Eric Clapton playing lead guitar ha as it had been on some of All Things Must Pass. It was just George you got. It, even though the solos are quite short, uh, on tracks like Light That Has Lighted The World, that is all, I think they're wonderful. Anyway, uh, Asuma Sen, the Lennon song from Mind Games, I thought Terry Wilson was quite, he, he writes well and he basically said it's pitched in a gloomy 6-8 time and too openly expresses Lennon's blues, its tiredness not lifted by Dave Spinoza's scorching guitar solo. 
Never in his career had he sounded so defeated. I thought that was interesting because I, I must admit I do, I do think Asuma Sen is a, is a depressing listen and it goes on at least a minute and a half too long for me. Um, musician credits, uh, very well researched and I think this is about the best place that you, you need to go and it's nice to have them in one place. We have had this book from Luca Parisi, um, which covered McCartney's career, but we'd never had all four Beatles, albeit only up to 74, in, but we've got them in one place. Obviously, Keith Badman on, in this masterpiece is, is pretty good in the detail he, he provides, but th this is pretty much definitive for me now. This is what will be the reference book when I'm looking at who plays on which track. Um, what else? Uh, nice to have it confirmed that Klaus Vormann is doing the backing vocals on Bringing It All Home to Me, you know, those, yeah, you know, that sort of low-pitched armstring yeahs in, the, in, the, um, in that song, that's Klaus. Uh, I think he's pretty fair to all of the albums here. When he was a little bit negative about Material World, I was worried that uh, t uh, Terry was going to be a little bit harsh on some of the albums that followed, but he's not really. He's, uh, he, he's not that enthusiastic about Dark Horse, but he said it's got some decent stuff on it. And Good Night Vienna as well. Um, uh, he does actually bite the bullet and say something quite controversial, that Band on the Run is the only Wings album to have truly stood the test of time. I'm not quite sure if he was including Ram in that or just strictly Wings albums, because Ram, I know it's strictly not a Wings album, but when Paul ever does another day or something in concert he says this is for the Wings fans so anyway he doesn't Terry doesn't say doesn't bite the bullet on whether All Things Must Pass is the only George album which has stood the test of time or whether Ringo is the only Ringo album uh, so it'd be interesting to know what he thinks of, on that score um, but then what's the definition of stood the test of time you know the fact that it's still listened to the fact that it's still talked about uh, because I can think of a couple of Beatles solo albums which are very near the top of my list which are not very well known at all outside the the fan base and so I don't necessarily think that they're any worse for that so but I, I get the point I get the point so Band on the Run is the one that <coughs> is mostly talked about so he, that, that's the point he's making. Uh, it's written with a quite a lot of sense of humour actually this book as well which I always like to see in a book um, Ian MacDonald was taking himself a little too seriously in my, for, for my liking. I like the, the bit what he's talking about because he says that is, that is all was covered by Andy Williams uh, with Klaus Foreman and Jim Keltner contributing and then when Harry Nielsen did a version of the same song in 76 it was virtually the same lineup again and he, he refers to these, these uh, same session men drifting from job to job uh, in the 70s, I thought that was quite amusing because um, they do turn up, the, the same names do turn up on a hell of a lot of albums, whether it's Andy Newmark or, or Tony Levin or uh, all of these session musicians, Jim Keltner. Um, that was amusing. And then when he's talking about the Utopian National Anthem, National, uh, what is it called? U Utopian International Anthem, and you know, all the sort of uh, airy fairy sort of make believe stuff about that and then he, then he then the next sentence back in the real world um several lawsuits were served on Lennon you know to try and kick him out of the country that I thought that was a nice nice piece uh, so now to finish the review I'm going to read you an example of one from each Beatle and, and show you Terry Wilson's writing so this is I'd have you any time which is um not a track which gets too much love so it's very nice to see this um uh, talked about um, very in very glowing terms. Uh, while Lennon and McCartney were content to work with their respective wives, Harrison surrounded himself with talent, one of the finest guitarists, one of the world's top producers, and in Dylan, one of the greatest songwriters of the era, and it shows. Swaying on the gentle waft of its relaxed chords, I'd have you any times a country mile ahead of anything the others had yet recorded and placed prestigiously at the start of All Things Must Pass, ushers in the album with a welcoming warmth. The illustrious collaboration, this illustrious collaboration must have drawn at least a tinge of envy from both McCartney and Lennon, if for differing reasons. So I think that's, that's well written. And if, you know, it's quite a thing to say, a country mile ahead of 
the stuff that the others had recorded, because don't forget, maybe I'm amazed and every night had been recorded by this stage. So, uh, but anyway, I'd, as I say, it's lovely to see I'd have any time get get some love. Uh, this is, um, what are we going to next? I think we're going to uh, the Paul song, Picasso's Last Words. Um, Constructed from pieces, the final collage ran to almost six minutes. Its cohesion remarkable given that its chief designer, McCartney, was untutored. Understanding that Picasso's method was to probe a pathway intuitively, changing and scrapping parts he didn't like as he progressed, McCartney's synesthetic expression of painting in sound is not only engaging sport, but a fitting tribute to its subject from one artist to another. McCartney's personality shows through the song's northern elements, the double-tracked bassoon solo, which he took pains to his oversee, resembling the theme to the working-class television drama Coronation Street, and the central role played throughout by his bass guitar, linking the sections with a running thread. Where McCartney's linking, liking for whimsical musical diversions had, has sometimes led to ghastly miscalculations of style, here his reaching outside of the conventional song form must be counted a success. Again, lovely to see a song like um, Picasso getting some love because it doesn't get an awful lot of love, does it really? Uh, you Are Here from Mind Games, uh, the ballad on side two. R recorded over six takes, You Are Here clocked in around the five minute mark before Lennon's decision to excise the second verse contra contrasting Japanese temples with English village greens. After Sneaky Pete redid his double track pedal steel, it was Dean Bready, a South Sea excursion floating away across gently undulating Pacific waves. The irony was that Lennon and Ono's marriage was similarly adrift. This passively thoughtful appeal conspicuously missing the vital urgency which had once driven the same obsessed man to write, I want you, she's so heavy. Nicely written. By the way, before I forget, um, when he said I'd have you any time country mile ahead of the others, we'd also had Cold Turkey about that time, which is a song which Terry Wilson's not too keen on. He calls it a, I think he calls it an awkward listen or a painful listen, but it's one of my favorites. Anyway, as he, as he said, you know, we're all gonna have our slant on different slants and things and that's fine. So the last track is a Ringo track I'm gonna read out. This is a track easy, easy for me uh, from Goodnight Vienna on side two. Uh, a miniature account of a forlorn love affair, the song's gentle descent down the scale describes the philosophical melancholy of the lyric, which culminates with a conclusive, if pessimistic, update on Lennon's, um, God, now the dream is over, uh, you know, Lennon's song, God, uh, and Ringo sings, now the dream's over. One of the most restrained recordings of Starr's career, Easy For Me, has an unforced clarity about it, which makes it an album highlight, tastefully arranged and unobtrusively positioned at the end of side two. So I think uh, this book is highly recommended. It really is. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's up there with the revolution in the head. It's... Uh, um, is going to end up being one of my reference books covering the solo career. And I do think this period is the most important five years of the Beatles solo career, just, not just because it was the one following the split, but because I think it contains, by and large, the best songs they they came up with. Not, not 100%, but uh, I think 80% of their great stuff post-Beatles was recorded in this period. So it's an essential work for any fan who is interested in the post Beatles um, work and I think uh, most people watching this video probably are so I, I, I can't say enough good things about this book well done Terry Wilson thank you for watching we'll see you next time